When I was growing up, there wasn't many a lot of things that I loved more than SpongeBob SquarePants. It started airing right when I was three years old, and I think from the moment I saw it, I was hooked. I saw every episode whenever one was on TV, I clamored to catch any rare clips that might only be available for one viewing, and I ate up any merchandising, gaming, or home media products that I could. Now when it comes to things I enjoyed as a kid, especially on Nickelodeon, more often than not I tend to look back and realize that a lot of stuff either hasn't aged well, or was just hot garbage to begin with. But with Spongebob, that deep and abiding love that I felt for the show then is something that has really never left me. I remember so strongly that Spongebob was the only show I liked as a kid that my dad could stand even in the slightest. With anything else, he'd say that it was too obnoxious or made with little love. And he told us that when we were older, we'd see shows in that exact same way. But whenever a new Spongebob would come on, he'd sit down with us and laugh and laugh, sometimes at moments I didn't quite understand and then we just talk about how great it had been. I can't put into words how special those evenings were. Knowing that even as the gap between me and the adults around me seemed massive, we're all just people. People willing to sit down and laugh at a show about a talking sponge. I truly think that SpongeBob SquarePants might be one of the most perfect animated series of all time, because it's constructed to appeal to almost everyone. You don't have to be a kid, and you don't have to be an adult. It's smart, but not condescending. It's funny, but not annoying. It's visually interesting, it has good storylines, it gets you hooked in its universe, but its loose flow lets you view it in a casual, non-strict way. It's often been asked, who is Spongebob actually supposed to be? Sometimes he feels like an adult, running to work and having drama with his colleagues. Other times he seems more like a child, going to what appears to be elementary school and failing to understand the basic principles of life around him. Well, I've always liked to view Spongebob as adulthood through the eyes of a child. Spongebob has responsibilities, he has adult friends, he has stresses and problems that he goes through, but he approaches it with a certain innocent attitude. One of the first jokes in the series also happens to be one that is so omnipresent that you might actually forget that it is a joke at all. That being that in the pilot episode, Spongebob's one ambition in life has always been to flip hamburgers at a shady fast food joint. The job that most people dread being stuck at their entire lives is the exact same one he barely has the spine to even approach without an inspiring pep talk, and that he does with such finesse and ardor that he's hired on the spot. Squidward, meanwhile, is adulthood as viewed through the eyes of an adult. He hates his job, he hates his annoying and loud neighbors, and he dreams of one day escaping from it all to prove himself as an artist. If you pay attention to people talking about this show after viewing it again, a common theme is that many find themselves viewing Squidward as the true main character of some episodes. Indeed, it seems not a coincidence that so many iconic scenes in Pizza Delivery, Squidville, and Just One Bite feature Squidward as the main focus beyond anyone else. I think that's possible partially because Squidward isn't wholly without his values. He has empathy, he cares about the people around him. He just doesn't enjoy the vibrant atmosphere that the universe of the show so often pitches his way. Patrick is stupid. He is the stupid friend. He lives under a rock, he rarely cares enough to understand what's happening around him, and in a way, it can almost be more of a detriment to keep him around. But he's SpongeBob's friend, and in the end, that's all that matters to the two of them. Patrick's main role in the show is being one of the funniest characters, with his inexplicable statements coupled with SpongeBob's insistence to pretend that he's one of the smartest people in town he's usually destined to get the funniest line of any episode he's in. I don't need this suit! <laughs> Sandy's a girl? There is a huge cast in SpongeBob SquarePants. So large that it's hard to casually list off and rightfully analyze them all at once. There's Sandy, SpongeBob's overzealous friend who moves to Bikini Bottom from Texas. Mr. Krabs, SpongeBob's greedy boss and the owner of the Krusty Krab. Plankton, Krabs' arch nemesis who wants to steal his secret patty recipe and always fails. Mrs. Puff, SpongeBob's driving instructor who always gets into peril because of his terrible skills behind the wheel. And of course, Fred. Fred is always hurting his leg. You could sneak up on me at work, did ya? SpongeBob SquarePants is primarily driven by the comedy of these characters. Because of this, the show is often known for episodes which are widely divergent in structure, theming, and purpose. For instance, many stories tend to have very easily understandable moral lessons that the audience is supposed to take away. Be yourself, use your imagination, don't facilitate the normalization of racist culture through the use of lowbrow comedy. You know, the classics! But then other episodes, like Hookie and I Had an Accident, openly mock the idea that the episode should be expected to carry some sort of lesson for their audience. 
Many episodes are structured through SpongeBob and see him experiencing something in his life. For instance, Rock Bottom is all about SpongeBob getting stranded in the middle of nowhere by himself and trying to survive in this alien environment long enough to get home. The entire episode feels like it's based on a real experience that someone on the staff had, and is just an exaggerated representation of what it's like to be in that situation. Meanwhile, episodes like ARG and a Club SpongeBob are farcical run-on narratives based around following board game treasure maps and forming cults while stranded in the middle of the jungle. Sometimes Sponge SpongeBob is our hero, the main character, and sometimes he himself becomes the nuisance, leading someone else to become the straight man. The only constant between story to story is that something happens in each episode, and the characters manage to make that circumstance extremely entertaining. The show thus becomes most known for its elaborate tango with the unpredictable, the illogical, and the out of place. Some of the most memorable episodes break rank by not even sticking to the most basic of status quo. For instance, the Algae's Always Greener sees Plankton creating a world where he has taken the place of Mr. Krabs, running the massively successful Krusty Krab. This leads to the ultimate twist in the episode, that Krabs has taken Plankton's spot in the adventure, becoming a naked vigilante trying to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula. Goodbye! everyone, I'll remember you all in therapy. Meanwhile, SP129 and UGG both deal with viewing different versions of the SpongeBob world existing across time. Episodes like these feel so extremely special because, by all accounts, they are interesting enough to justify entire spin-offs based around their concepts, but they were never explored outside of these singular episodes. Seeing a new SpongeBob alive felt special and exciting because literally anything could happen in it and it would still be a blast. Sometimes an episode would be so hyped up that Nick would host a marathon of episodes before the new one, and on occasion, Patchy the Pirate himself would appear and would hype up his love for SpongeBob alongside the other Nick hosts. I remember so much about these segments, all the little skits and jokes that Patchy would do with the Nick hosts, but I've never seen any of them resurface online, and sometimes I wonder if I made it all up in a Nick-induced fever dream. Near the time when I stopped watching, there was certainly a new trend of a lot of Spongebob episodes having these huge, epic plots with characters going on Hobbit-like adventures. Atlantis Square Pantis, Dunces and Dragons, The Lost Episode, and of course the two movies are all examples of this. Now I'll clarify that I do seriously love stories where the characters face some kind of real threat. Frankendoodle, for instance, is a great epic of an episode, with Spongebob and Patrick finding a pencil which has been dropped from above and using it to create ghastly creations, including an evil sketch of Spongebob himself. Then, of course, the International Justice League of Super Acquaintances saw several of the main characters becoming superheroes to battle the evil supergroup Every Villain is Lemons, in a story which is certainly one of the greats. But I primarily think that these stories work because we're already invested in the characters on screen. The ones that I consider to be the most classic have surprisingly mundane plots which turn out to be extremely funny because the characters are just that entertaining. Like chocolate with nuts. An entire episode about Spongebob and Patrick going door to door trying to sell people chocolate bars. Such a simple story and yet one of the most iconic in the show. Every person they meet delivers a new string of killer jokes. Every single one stitched into the mind of anyone who has seen the episode even once. The camping episode, fun band geeks. All these stories have such simple ideas behind them. They're things which are not complex from an outside perspective, and yet they are also some of the greatest 11 minute viewing sessions you'll ever live through. But my favorite episode has always just been The Graveyard Shift. The entire story is just Spongebob and Squidward being forced to work overnight when no one is coming to the restaurant. To scare Spongebob, Squidward makes up, basically, a creepypasta about the Krusty Krab, but as the night goes on, it starts to seem like that story is actually turning true. There's a funny anecdote about this one. My family couldn't always afford extravagant Halloween costumes every year. So for a few years in a row, me and my sister would always reuse these old cloaks with hoods on them. One year I went as Harry Potter, the next I was a Dementor. There were a lot of cloak-based Harry Potter costumes, but one year I just put on the cloak, stole a spatula from the kitchen, and became the Hashlinging Slasher. That was the best Halloween costume I ever did, and in turn, I think that turned out to be the best Halloween of my entire youth. When I recently heard about the passing of Steven Hillenburg, I felt a hole in my heart rip open and tear into a million pieces. I recall so vividly sitting up as late as I could on a Spongebob-obsessed fever, soaking in all the behind-the-scenes features that came on the DVDs. Hearing Steven talk about the history of the show, how he had taught marine biology after graduating college, and how he had created the comic that would become Spongebob to teach kids about ocean life, it was just so mesmerizing that this world, all these characters, and these entertaining stories had originated from this one man. I mean, I had a lot of rough days growing up. 
and Spongebob was one of my main releases from that. It helped me cope with a lot of terrible times, and that's all thanks to one man who chose to create something special like this. I know that saying Spongebob is good is a lot like saying grass is green or the sky is blue, but I just wanted to do a quick little video where I talked about how much this meant to me and why it works so well. I hope we can use this as a chance to remember the great good that this man brought into the world, and additionally, the legacy that will live on because of what he made. So I didn't quite know how to end this video, so I, I, I ran over to my folks' place and I collected together a bunch of stuff left over from when I was a kid. A lot of this is just uh, merchandising, an old Lego instruction manual. I was quite destructive with things I owned as a kid, so uh, most of the stuff did not survive. This is really special to me. Uh, I would always get the box sets for Christmas. Each season, one year at a time, usually a few years behind whatever season was airing. And uh, every box set would come, with a, would come with a little letter, sort of on the outside of the box, that was very easy to lose. Now most of these were written in character by Patchy the Pirate, but the very first one is actually written by Steven Hillenburg. I always thought these letters were really special, you know? It added a real personal touch to the DVDs, and it made it feel a bit more like a collector's thing. And I don't know, when I found this the other day, I, it was a very bittersweet moment, you know? But the, the real reason that I wanted to do this was that was because of this. Now this, right here, this is a Spongebob coloring book. Now this was a great thing to buy as a kid because what it did was it, it recapped some of the funniest moments across the entire show. Right there you could have all your favorite episodes right in front of you and some of the, some of the best jokes. But I saw it for a different purpose. I realized that because these were all coloring book retellings of famous stories, that I myself could create my own Spongebob episodes, insert them into the pages, and add my own stories to the mythology. And that's what we're going to look at today. My very own Spongebob fan fiction. So this is a... Spongebob Squire Ponce story, and it is called Squangebob Mets the Transformers, part one. There's a multi-part arc right here. You guys need to prepare yourselves for what might be some of the most lucrative storytelling that any five-year-old has ever come up with. Prepare to have your, your, your view of this, of this universe, this world, completely reshapen in front of your eyes. Here we got Spongebob, he's pointing at these cars, and he says, Look, Patrice, the on two bots And then Patrick's like, and a new member. This is the latest member of the on two bots that epic action-fighting team. I just want to add, this is an incredibly accurate illustration of what this toy looks like. So this is the only part of the story where the Autobots are involved. I don't know why this was left in. Now this is a giant robot like city-sized giant robot, and it lands on Bikini Bottom, and someone says, No, the robot has landed on Squidward's home, and Squidward's, Squidward's home is destroyed. He's not even in the story, but now he doesn't have a home. Now, I think at this point they're Power Rangers, because uh, it seems to me they've both morphed, and this is Red Sponge, and this is High Ready Ready, And their morphers form a big megazord. But it's not big enough because the giant city-sized robot, he steps on it. Then that shatters into a million pieces. Now it's a dragon. The city-sized robot is never seen again in this narrative. I was a very good storyteller. The dragon shoots some fire. You know, they jump. I clearly trace some of this. But then, the same the same guy on the boat who drops the pencil in that one episode of Spongebob, he drops pencil again. So Spongebob says, I draw me new pants because the magic pen pencil... <laughs> I was trying to say the magic pencil returns. And uh, Spongebob has the magic pencil again, and he draws himself a gun. I personally think this is how every episode of Spongebob should end. Pulls the gun, and I think it's a, it might be a water pistol, that might be the joke. That puts the fire out and maybe electrocutes him. And he explodes. 
I really think I've captured the tone of Spongebob here. Certainly the, the, the humor and, and the finesse of the show is, is represented clearly in these two pages. To be continued. And in the next one, Spongebob and Patrick are gonna fight the Daleks. Spongebob was like so much more than just like a show to me. I think I owe so much of my drive as an adult to the Spongebob franchise. Like I said before, I just wanted to sit down and talk about how much I love this show. <laughs> I guess I don't really have much else to say. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching and for putting up with me. I hope you guys have a, have a good day, alright? I'll talk to you later.